<coughs> excuse me. Doctor, uh, excuse me, Dr. Uh, Gorman and Rose are both from Oxitech, a company that has pioneered the use of genetic modification technologies in the development of genetic biocontrol strategies and their application to insects of public health and agricultural significance. After a long career at Rothamsted Research as an entomological researcher working on sap feeding insects along with many other things, Dr. Gorman joined Oxitech in 2012. He's the chief development officer at Oxitech, where he's responsible for operational deployment of the Oxitech technologies and all of the many complexities associated with that. Dr. Rose is the head of regulatory affairs at Oxitech and has been with the company since 2016. Dr. Rose leads Oxitech's regulatory policy and the applications in multiple geographies, including the US and Brazil. So with that, let me welcome both of you and to thank you for your willingness to participate in, in today's webinar. Um, let me invite you to sh your share your presentation. Uh, Kevin, if, if you're ready to do that, go ahead and do that. I'm going to, uh, very good. And if I can see it, you're now on uh, presentation mode. Are you ready to go? Excellent, thank you. Uh, very Good. generous. You might just check there. your audio. You might be on mute still. Hopefully, you can hear me. I shouldn't be on mute. Can you hear me, Dave? Oh uh, yes, we can hear you, Dr. Gorman. Great, super. Uh, thank you, okay. uh, Dave. Uh, a really generous introduction, and uh, we're just delighted uh, to be able to have the opportunity to speak to everybody today and give this webinar. Um, both Nathan and I, um, you know, uh, uh, are quite experienced with Oxitech now, and uh, you know these kind of opportunities are, are, are things that we love to snap up because um, they really help uh, us get the message out, give everybody information, and uh, allow us to answer questions at the end, which is uh, super it's superbly interactive. Uh, so thank you, uh, not just for the introductions, Dave, but to you and to Hector and to Tara uh, and the organisers for, for making this possible. Um, we're going to talk to you today uh, about the self-limiting insect platform that we have. Uh, this is a platform uh, whereby uh, we release uh, pest insects, uh, which we've modified uh, so that they uh, mate with wild insects. Uh, it's a biological approach and uh, those wild insects once, mate, once mated can't produce offspring. Um, it's an innovative tool, uh, a biological, environmentally safe tool, uh, which we really hope can revolutionize uh, the way that these biological systems are worked and technologies are, are employed um, by changing its accessibility, uh, by making it available, widely available, uh, very low tech deployment, um, and, and really, as I say, revolutionizing the way that these biological uh, tools have been used previously. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, Dave's already introduced uh, myself and Nathan Rose. Next slide. So we'll start with a, an introduction to Oxitex technology. I'll hand over to Nathan and he'll guide you through uh, some of the details uh, about exactly how this platform works. It's a platform that we can apply to different insect species and we're looking at uh, insects that affect both public health, uh, agriculture, and also uh, animal health as well. So um, we'll then move on once we've been through a couple of those model insects uh, through to a question and answer session. Okay, I'll uh, move over and hand you to Nathan. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, just making sure that you can hear me all right. Can indeed. Great. Okay. So briefly, just to talk about Oxitech, um, our mission as a company is to improve lives and livelihoods by developing safe and effective biologically engineered solutions to control both disease transmitting and crop destroying insects. And the important aspect of this, which I think we'll touch on today in more detail, is really bringing these solutions uh, at scale globally. Um, Oxitech as a company has been around for almost 20 years. It was originally founded out of Oxford University in 2002, and our research headquarters is still based just outside Oxford in the UK. 
But over these years, we have built a lot of strong partnerships with leaders, both in the agricultural space and in public health. And we'll talk a little bit about that further today. We've released over a billion of our self-limiting mosquitoes in a variety of different countries to date, um, without any adverse effects on either human or animal health or on the environment. Um, all of our work uh, goes through peer-reviewed publication, and we have over 100 publications to date, and also a wide range of biosafety and regulatory rulings globally. Our team, uh, based in the UK and in Brazil and the United States at the moment, has more than 15 nationalities, and we really value that aspect of the company, uh, bringing a lot of people who are very passionate about the mission that we have. All right, so briefly just to touch on some of the partners that we are working with currently or have worked with in the past. Um, on the agricultural front, we have a long-standing collaboration with Bayer, uh, particularly focused on agricultural pest insects, which we'll talk about later. Also work with the Wellcome Trust and the UK-based research, uh, research and innovation organizations. And then collaborations as well with the CDC, with other public health institutes in various countries, Panama, Cayman, and, and Australia. And then on the regulatory front, um, approvals in the US from EPA, FDA, and USDA for various insects along the way. And then also particularly in Brazil, uh, several approvals now from the Brazilian National, Sci National Biosafety Technical Commission, CTN Bio. And as I've mentioned, um, we have published extensively on our work and links to all of those publications are available through the Oxitec website if you're interested in more details about how the technology works. So I'd like to start just by talking generally about how our self-limiting technology works um, and the genes and, and the, the, the type of approach that we use um, can be applied to many different insects. And I'll start by talking about its application in Aedes aegypti, uh, but then we'll talk again later about Anopheles mosquitoes and also about the fall armyworm and, and soybean looper crop pests. So looking at Aedes aegypti, um, our self-limiting mosquito technology provides a number of different attributes uh, to help us actually control this really important public health pest. We have inserted two genes into this mosquito, and I'll talk about those on one of the coming slides. But what those genes provide us with is the ability to release only male mosquitoes, which do not bite. They allow us to release mosquitoes which are fully traceable in the field and which are also fully self-limiting in the environment. And as Dave mentioned at the start, one of the advantages about all these approaches, whether it's SIT or whether it's the genetically modified approach that we use here, is that it provides species specific targeted suppression of only the species of interest without impacting other beneficial insects in the environment. The genes that we've put into the mosquitoes and, and also into our other insects produce proteins which are safe, which are non-toxic and which are non-allergenic. And we also have uh, extensive field proof of concept of these mosquitoes. And we'll talk about some of those results in the coming slide as well. So there are two genes which we've put into the mosquito. Um, the first is what we call a conditional female specific self-limiting gene. And this diagram here explains a little bit about how this works. The self-limiting gene produces a protein called TTAV. And in the absence of tetracycline antibiotics, which bind this protein and prevent it from binding to DNA. This protein sets up a feedback loop with the gene that actually produces this protein. So once you have some of this TTLE protein produced, it will then bind to its own minimal promoter. Um, that will then produce more of this protein that in turn will bind back to the promoter and so on. And so with this positive feedback loop, you soon have an accumulation of this protein in the cells where it's expressed. And when it's expressed at high levels, this causes cell death. And what we've done is we've taken this gene and we have linked it to a sex specific splicing module. And the splicing module originally comes from Aedes aegypti. It's a natural splicing module, which has been coupled to this gene. And what it does is it ensures that this gene can only be translated into protein in female mosquitoes. So only in female mosquitoes is this protein actually produced at high levels and then all as a result of that, only in female mosquitoes do we actually have lethality caused by this protein. Males are unaffected uh, because they're not able to splice this correctly and therefore not able to produce this protein. 
what this means is that we can produce male only cohorts of mosquitoes by rearing them without any tetracyclines present. We can do that in a factory context, or as we'll talk about, we can also do that in the field. And that's a really important aspect of these mosquitoes. Alternatively, we can turn off the activity of that protein by supplementing the larval rearing diet with a small amount of tetracycline class antibiotic that blocks that feedback loop. And then we're able to produce both male and female mosquitoes in the factory context. That allows us to breed this colony and produce eggs, which can then be deployed in the field. And in the field, if we rear those eggs without any tetracyclines present, we'll produce only male mosquitoes. So females cannot survive to adulthood when this gene is active. Male mosquitoes are unaffected. And importantly, those males can also pass on the self-limiting gene to their offspring. And so we can achieve significant multi-generational suppression uh, by releasing just a single generation of these mosquitoes. Because the gene kills females at larval stages of development, we can also achieve male-only production with a huge reduction in complexity compared to previous approaches, which relied on physical sex sorting of male and female mosquitoes, usually at the pupil stage. And what this has done is it's enabled us to actually use egg release devices where we can take eggs, deploy them in the field and produce male mosquitoes in situ in the field. We have released more than 20 million of these male mosquitoes in Brazil over uh, two and a half field seasons. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the data from that in one of the coming slides. And as I mentioned earlier, the company has released over a billion mosquitoes, both the, the earlier version of this and, and this current OX5034 technology globally. So <clears throat> talking a little bit more about how we see the application of this OX5034 Aedes aegypti mosquito. This has really been designed, as I said, for targeted pest reduction. It has multi-generational uh, pest suppression because the males can pass on this gene to their offspring. Um, it's fully self-limiting, so within a few generations it disappears from the environment. And it has a very small ecological footprint because it is specific just to this Aedes aegypti mosquito, which in most of its range is an invasive species. Additionally, um, because we have males continuing to survive and to pass on this gene, they can also pass on their other background genetics to the wild population. And as a result of that, we have the potential to reverse insecticide resistance in the wild pest populations. And that's something that we've demonstrated with agricultural pest insects in the past, and also something which has a very strong basis in population modeling. And some of the references are, are shown on this slide here to support that. What this means is that this tool has the potential to restore insecticide susceptibility and that can offer synergy with existing insecticides, which are often starting to suffer from the problem of resistance throughout the range of this particular mosquito. We can produce male mosquitoes for production in the field. The sex sorting of males from females is mediated by the genetics that we've introduced into this mosquito. And this avoids the releases of biting females and it also significantly reduces the production cost. There is no need here to produce male mosquitoes as adults in a factory and transport those and release them as adults. We've also introduced a fluorescent marker gene into this mosquito. Um, and this has given us the ability to monitor this mosquito at all life stages, whether it's larval, pupil or adult in the field. And the really key thing about this technology is that it is because we can release males uh, by producing them in the field, this has dramatically improved the scalability and the options for deploying these mosquitoes in the environments where they're really needed, particularly um, in the tropics in developing countries where Aedes aegypti is a major public health problem. The eggs have an extensive shelf life. They can be shipped within the normal supply chain um, anywhere in the world. They can be stockpiled and they can also be deployed by a wide range of end users. And so we're very excited about all of the, the potential that this new uh, genetic sexing strain of this mosquito is unlocking in terms of the ability to actually get this to the people that need it. So I'm gonna hand over to Kevin again, um, who's gonna talk through some of the 80s programs which we currently have underway, and which we're about to initiate. And then we'll move on from that to talk about Anopheles and also uh, full army worm after that. Super, thank you, Nathan, uh, much obliged. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ADs projects and deployments that we've done over the years. And I'll start with the next slide um, and just really talk about the box itself. We've done deployments uh, with uh, a previous strain, uh, OX5138, uh, which, um, which is probably well known to many of you. Uh, and then we uh, pivoted back in 2018 to this strain that Nathan's been describing, uh, OX5034. And it's that genetic sexing of OX5034, which really allows us uh, to do these very simple low-tech deployments uh, using these, these boxes uh, made for release. So uh, they're simple boxes. They're very good at maintaining the temperature. Um, and into those boxes, we have uh, prepackaged essentially with eggs and with some diet uh, to help those larvae develop once, they've ha once those eggs have hatched. Uh, there's a water stabilizer as well. And on the addition of water, so a just add water approach, if you like, um, we can uh, then can, the, the density of those mosquitoes is controlled, the amount of food is controlled, and they grow and nurture themselves through um, in the box, directly in the field, and then release themselves out of the exit holes that you see at the top of those boxes there, uh, just below the lid line. But uh, that really enables a, a, a revolutionary step change, if you like, from those old um, adult releases, uh, typically uh, used with uh, SIT type, uh, analogous technologies, if you like, to SIT, SIT for mosquito releases. Um, here, the mosquitoes are releasing themselves. Uh, they're choosing when they want to come out of that box. Um, and we can put those boxes into the environment in different places rather than having to release those mosquitoes out of the back of a truck at a particular time of day, according to the operations of the actual uh, users. And as Nathan was saying, uh, the fact that we don't have to worry about the QC, the quality control, because we can't produce females in these boxes, uh, even if we try, uh, it means that you don't need training uh, we can put these boxes straight out into the field with the eggs and only males will come out uh, and that makes it um, incredibly efficient. Uh, no big factories, no high levels of quality control, uh, no fitness effects or costs uh, associated with all the transport and the logistics of those males. And these can be shipped uh, around the world from a central source. With Aedes aegypti, as, again, as Nathan mentioned in the previous slide, there's a good shelf life of three to six months. So that gives us the ability uh, to ship these and for, for, for users to essentially stock, uh, stockpile these uh, according to their use patterns. It makes it very accessible, uh, makes it very easy to use, very simple. And this really is uh, fundamental uh, to having the impact we think this technology can make. Once those, uh, the water is in the box, uh, there's about 10 days, depending upon temperature, uh, before those males start to emerge. And then those males will start to trickle out of that box and continue to do so for a further 10 to 14 days. So not only does it do um, a, a more sensitive release, but it releases in a more gradual way as well, which allows uh, an extended period between uh, reapplying, if you like. So instead of having to uh, apply several times a week, sometimes daily, as with some of the previous technologies, uh, now these boxes can be just refueled, if you like, with a disposable uh, cartridge system um, that replenishes the eggs and the water is replaced uh, every, uh, every week to 10 days, maybe even as much as every two weeks. Next slide, please, Nathan. So this is a, a, a summary, if you like, um, a snapshot of, of the projects that we've done over the years um, with uh, su suppression as the goal. Um, these span different uh, countries, uh, different continents, uh, but also show you some of the uh, first generation and second generation uh, technologies we use. So that first generation OX 513A, uh, they are shown in blue on the left-hand side. And we've released in Cayman Islands, uh, several in Brazil, in Panama, and they culminated uh, in 2015 to 19 with a, a four-year pilot program covering 65,000 people uh, in the city of Piracicaba in Brazil. We had great results uh, all, the way, uh, all the way along and um, a minimum level of suppression of well over 80% uh, in that four-year suppression 
against 65,000 people. So very good uh, results year on year. Maximum suppression values consistently over 90%. In the green there on the right hand side, uh, show, it shows uh, uh, our, our results as we've moved into our second generation. Starting in 2018 and 19 in a city called Indachiba in Brazil, uh, our pilots have run through the last uh, uh, two and a half seasons now um, in that city and have given us very successful results. Um, slightly increasing on the performance of the first generation as we may have predicted uh, because of those extra sensitive releases. And we're hoping to do uh, releases in the US for the first time this year um, uh, in the Florida Keys. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the coming slides also. At top left there, the pie charts, uh, the darker blue pie charts show some of the um, uh, public acceptance. Community engagement is, is, is critical. Uh, we've learned over the years that um, these kind of projects really can't be successful without not just the, um, the knowledge and the, um, uh, the support of the people, but also actually uh, for them to get involved. Uh, these are urban environments, uh, these are releases uh, of insects um, within the streets and, you know, surveillance traps as well as release points um, uh, are far more effective uh, if we can uh, use, use all sorts of properties, both public and private. So um, these values that you see here um, uh, for fully supporting the project, uh, wanting the project to continue or extending the project across the city, or values uh, for public acceptance for a thousand residents in Persicaba after that four year program of 65,000 people I mentioned. So very strong support and often we see that support growing as the project progresses. Thank you, Nathan. Here's a little bit more about that community engagement. As I mentioned, it's fundamental to all our projects and has been uh, uh, from the start. Uh, we use a variety of tools. Uh, we know that, um, that community engagement and stakeholder engagement needs to be bespoke uh, for the location. Uh, everywhere has its, uh, its differences and its peculiarities. And so we always like to engage a partner, a strong partner, a local partner who can really help us um, shape and deliver that community engagement program effectively. We've used um, shopping mall displays, uh, hand in the cage demonstrations, public meetings, leaflets, um, speaker vans, uh, radio adverts, um, indeed um, lots of online and social media uh, support too. It's a really vital component and uh, we can't stress enough uh, exactly uh, how much effort goes into this and how, uh, how valuable it is, how much it pays off and really allows those projects to flourish. And these particular pie charts you see here are from the uh, following the first uh, 5034, OX 5034 trial in, uh, project in Indachiba, um, where we saw again, well over 90% support for the project uh, and people wanting that project to be uh, expanded across the city. Here's some of the results from the second um, OX5034 study that we did, uh, that project in, in Dachiba in its second year, uh, releasing uh, using uh, boxes uh, as well as eggs. Uh, so this was really a, a full test, if you like, of the prototype uh, deployment system. It gave us great results. Um, the trajectories you see on your right hand side there, the anticipated trajectory in the sort of salmon color, um, that was what we might have seen uh, with OX513A uh, with a 10 to 12 week starting point before we really saw any effect take hold. Uh, with this uh, particular technology, potentially because of the sensitive releases, uh, because those insects are coming out maybe um, fitter and healthier, um, we see, um, we, we saw the effect much sooner. Within just three to four weeks, we started to see uh, the pest uh, population uh, decline in this region. This is a uh, dense urban neighborhoods, um, relatively confined areas within a very dense urban uh, setting. The, the reduction in the population in the wild type population then increased uh, over the period of about 14 weeks till it had hit around about 90% suppression. Um, 
uh, a very good result in showing that these kind of biological approaches can really have an impact quite quickly. Um, we expect them uh, to give impact within a full season, uh, but to see this so quickly from the start of the season meant that the insects, uh, the, the wild insects really didn't take off at all that year. As Nathan's talked about, um, they're really, you know, we've proven this is safe, we've proven the efficacy in the field, uh, that we get really uh, full penetrance, as we call it, 100% kill of those female offspring. And what's really important is the reduction in operations that these, uh, these, this box delivery method uh, really has shown. So we've, we've looked at the operational implications and we see a huge level of reduction in the complexity and uh, resource requirements uh, to, get these, to get this kind of technology out there as compared uh, with, with previous flavors. Thank you, Nathan. As I mentioned, uh, we also uh, are very much looking forward to doing releases uh, in the US for the first time. And uh, these all uh, take place uh, in the Florida Keys, uh, hopefully later this year. Uh, this has been uh, uh, quite a long road for us. Um, and uh, we've got a fabulous partner in the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District who've really uh, supported this and pulled this along all the way from the beginning of a, of a long-standing collaboration uh, back in about 2011, I think. So uh, this particular experimental use permit that has been approved uh, by the EPA and by the state regulators um, uh, went through a very comprehensive review process. Um, the EPA did an outstanding job ensuring that this was a very robust uh, analysis and review. Uh, and then that was followed at the state level uh, by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services uh, also supported by a range of bureaus and uh, agencies um, that also uh, reviewed that application and gave it its unanimous approval. They included the Florida Department of Health, Department of Environmental Protection in Florida, and also Florida Fish and Wildlife. The Centers for Disease and Control, uh, a very reputable organization, of course, uh, also contributed to the review uh, by helping the EPA uh, with some of their analyses. Uh, one uh, of the key points from that, um, from that review, if you like, uh, was um, obviously the impact that this kind of technology may have on, uh, on the environment. Um, and the EPA looked at this uh, very deeply, as well as all the other agencies I've just mentioned. And the outcome was that there is no uh, risk of a significant effect on any of these uh, different organisms, fish, birds, mammals, plants, invertebrates, and uh, other aquatic animals. There was a large dossier submitted uh, by Oxitec to the EPA for review, over 4,500 pages. And um, uh, the, the, the whole dossier was, was reviewed in depth. And um, that included feeding studies uh, where uh, different organisms, freshwater fish and invertebrates, uh, were exposed to a diet uh, primarily composed of our larvae, and they were just seen to, uh, uh, to flourish. Thank you, Nathan. So on to a little bit about the project in the US uh, and this Florida Keys project that we're hoping to start this year. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, fully approved now, not just by the regulators, um, uh, federal and state that I talked about, but also by the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District themselves, who, who took a, a vote on this last year, uh, approved the project. And so um, we are now uh, clear to go. And uh, we're just um, in the preparation phases now. The project is designed in a couple of different phases. Um, and the first one is a single point release. So this will be a single box where we'll release insects uh, through using that egg release system. And those males will go out and we'll look to see exactly how far they fly, how long they live, uh, and really what kind of coverage we get off that box itself in terms of its output. Uh, we'll then use that data as well as data that we've gleaned from Brazil uh, to do multi-point releases. Um, so there we'll look at a small area uh, where we've got boxes replicated across the area um, and we'll look to see the overall impact there. Um, we'll also be looking at cryptic breeding sites and other 
um, and other aspects in that, uh, that, that second study. We're expecting both studies uh, to be completed within a single mosquito season, uh, weather willing, climate willing, if you like, and, um, and both of these studies are replicated and compared to untreated areas to ensure that the analysis is very robust. One aspect of these studies is to follow up with um, post releases with an analysis of their, um, of, of their persistence, if you like, that multi generational effect that Nathan was talking about. So we expect for several generations that these mosquitoes are going to continue to provide, um, provide efficacy, provide, provide a, an impact. And we will, as we have done in Brazil, we'll measure the decline of that impact over time as those insects disappear from the environment. And we expect that to happen within about three to 10 generations. Um, just on the right hand side there, uh, you can see uh, one of the traps, BG trap. Uh, we use traps, uh, both uh, adult traps and what we call ovi traps. Uh, they are essentially uh, egg traps that are, uh, capture the eggs laid by uh, passing females. And we use both measures uh, to look at the population. Uh, the egg traps are far more sensitive and uh, usually much better for looking at low level populations and uh, uh, the BG traps very good for looking at how our adults fly and we can place those out into the environment and the pheromones in there will pick up those, those, those males as they fly past. Thanks Nathan. As I mentioned, CDC were involved in the review uh, with EPA, and we were absolutely delighted when uh, Lyle Peterson sent uh, a letter across stating that the CDC uh, would also uh, provide technical assistance to FKM CD uh, for this project and, uh, and really support and make sure that that uh, data evaluation is nice and ro robust. And they're certainly very excited at the prospect that this kind of technology can make uh, as, our, as ourselves, of course. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're delighted, as I mentioned, that this is a, this is a formal collaboration uh, and supported by such a, uh, such a reputable organization as CDC. Uh, in terms of support, uh, public engagement, we're doing a lot. Uh, we are um, working very hard uh, right through the keys uh, and, and broader as well. Uh, to ensure that stakeholders and communities uh, understand all they need to about this project and have the information they would like. And that kind of community engagement has been going on for a long time. Uh, back in 2016, there was a referendum uh, and this uh, essentially uh, put the prospect of an Oxitec project with uh, our old technology, Ox 513A, on the ballot paper. And uh, a vote was had, um, uh, this was November 2016, and 31 out of 33 uh, precincts in Monroe County uh, voted in support of this particular project. Uh, a, a landslide victory, if you like, in some ways, but certainly the most, the largest um, vote on a, a genetically modified technology uh, that, uh, that, that we know of, um, with uh, tens of thousands of, of respondents in this particular uh, study, in, the, in this particular referendum. The vast majority of these precincts did support us, uh, as I mentioned, uh, some as high as uh, uh, over 80% support, and, um, and most of them were, 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 were close to the 50 mark uh, if they, if they uh, uh, were below. So you can see two there that didn't, uh, that didn't vote uh, for the project, um, but they were very close to the 50% mark. So very strong support throughout the Keys, uh, right from uh, uh, down towards Key West all the way up uh, to Key Largo. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, a little flavor of some of the community engagement that's going on recently. So uh, we do virtual tours, lots of webinars. Uh, these are public webinars held every month, open to everybody online. Uh, you can access lots of details, including how to get uh, um, an invitation to these webinars uh, from our website. We have a project website as well as the Oxitec one. Uh, if you go to the Oxitec website, uh, you will be able to get links to everywhere from there. Uh, but we've also got the project website at keysmosquitoproject.com. Uh, we've had virtual tours, so videos in and around the labs, uh, both of Brazil, uh, the US and the UK. Um, we've sent um, 
mail us out to all the people uh, in the local areas and we knock on doors, uh, speak to residents, uh, give them information. And we've uh, also included them in uh, votes to decide which uh, design of our boxes uh, we should be using during the project. So lots of very extensive uh, engagement. And as I mentioned right at the start, it, it's not just about education, but it's about getting integration and involvement of these projects as well. Okay, so I guess in summary, um, you know, this is male only production, that's key. Um, all, only the females die. Male only production for release and it uses genetic sexing. It allows these field deployments um, we've had um, uh, at, at scale and they're on the back of some very successful large scale deployments with 513A. All of that led to full biosafety approval in Brazil. Uh, so we have full approval to release anywhere in Brazil without further. Um, without further biosafety license. So um, that really just is testament to the safety of this particular technology. And the first US pilot project uh, we're hoping to kick off very soon indeed. Uh, the egg-based deployment, uh, as Nathan was alluding to, is really what um, revolutionizes uh, the accessibility and the scalability of this kind of, of, of product, of this kind of biological tool. And uh, we're just super excited uh, to uh, in anticipation of the impact that it really might make. At that point, I will hand it over to Nathan again, who will talk about the Nuffleys. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, so we've talked about Aedes uh, as the vector of dengue and yellow fever and Zika and chikungunya. I'm just going to talk a little bit about two programs that we currently have uh, in collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We are developing the same uh, genetic technology in two Anopheles species. So these are malaria vectors, Anopheles albimanus, which is the uh, one of the main malaria vectors in Mesoamerica and some of the Caribbean islands. And then Anopheles stevensi, which is a major urban malaria vector originally found in South Asia, but in the last few years having spread throughout the Arabian Peninsula and now is found in several countries in the Horn of Africa as well. And this is of major concern to a variety of organizations that are working to target malaria in Africa, that this new urban vector is really starting to find a foothold in East Africa. Um, and so there is a lot of effort currently being directed at finding new tools to be able to deal particularly with Anopheles Stevens eye. So what we're doing right now is developing the same, what we call our second generation self-limiting technology. So this is male only production, uh, female only lethality in both of these Anopheles species uh, and bringing those to the stage where they are ready for early stage field pilots. And then a second phase of this project focuses on developing a pathway to actually bring these Anopheles strains to the field. So working through the necessary regulatory approvals and making sure that we can pilot these in the relevant geographies. Uh, to target those Anopheles uh, malaria vectors. And just looking broadly across the landscape uh, of organizations that we look forward to working with, many of these we have started engaging with as well. Uh, as we look at the global stage um, in terms of malaria control, and then also at the regional level, um, particularly in the African context, the African Union, NEPAD, uh, Pan-African Mosquito Control, and then similarly in the Americas. And then also working uh, with the, the national ministries that have responsibility for actually dealing with malaria. So we're very excited about this work. Um, it's proceeding well, and we are looking forward to bringing these strains to the field as soon as we can. And then I'll spend the last few minutes of this presentation talking about uh, some of our agriculture programs. So this picture here, uh, some of our staff taking our genetically modified fall armyworm out into the field for the first field releases of this in Brazil in 2019. Um, we focus on a number of different agricultural pest insects. So we have already done field releases of three of these. Um, diamondback moth, which is a major pest of brassica and other row crops. Um, we have done field releases of this in New York State in 2017. Um, almost 15 years ago now, we did releases of uh, pink bollworm 
um, sterilized Oxitec moths released on commercial corn as part of an eradication program in the southwestern United States. And then in Brazil, starting in 2019, we've released uh, self-limiting fall armyworm. So very, very similar genes to what we have in our mosquitoes, male only production, female lethality. And we've had strong performance so far in the field trials um, and a lot of data also demonstrating suppression and also insecticide resistance management in contained trials. And then finally, the Mediterranean fruit fly, um, which has long been uh, a mainstay of sterile insect technique. Um, we've also generated self-limiting strains, which have actually been successful in outperforming insecticides and protecting fruit crops. And again, contained trials have been completed um, against medfly populations in a variety of different locations. Excuse me. Our fall armyworm program is one that we are particularly excited about. Uh, fall armyworm, Spodopra frugipoda, is a pest that has devastating effects on a variety of different crops worldwide, but particularly on corn. In many places, it's developed resistance to biotech corn traits. And in Latin America and in Africa, it is now a major challenge for growers. Uh, in Brazil alone, it's estimated to cause more than $2 billion worth of crop losses and additional management costs per year. Um, both insecticides and biotech traits are no longer as effective against fall armyworm. In Brazil, it's basically resistant to every single biotech trait with the acceptance of the, uh, the VIP-3 trait. Um, and as a result, it is a significant problem uh, economically in, in many different countries. It made its way across to Africa in 2016, um, and it's now found throughout Sub-Saharan Africa where it's causing major crop losses, both to commercial and subsistence farming. And as a result, um, there is a need for new tools to address this particular pest. So we have developed the same self-limiting technology in fall armyworm, and it has a variety of different potential benefits. It will obviously be important in reducing pest populations to very low levels. But we also think that it's going to be very helpful in slowing and more potentially reversing the development of resistance to both biotech traits and also to insecticides. And in so doing, it can reduce the reliance of farmers on existing tools, improve sustainability, reduce the impact on beneficial species. And we have now deployed this um, in Brazil since 2019 on pilot scale. So really looking at some of the very uh, initial parts of, of what's important in evaluating one of these insects, biosafety endpoints and so on. Um, and we continue to deploy that in the field um, right now as well. We are also at the moment uh, developing similar technology in another major crop pest. This is soybean looper, Chrysodexis includens. Um, it's a big pest of soybean in Brazil and in other countries in the Americas. And it is also now resistant to many different sprayed insecticides. Thankfully, at this point, there is not yet widespread resistance to biotech traits in soybean, um, but this is likely to develop in time as well. And so similarly to what we've developed in fall armyworm, this is intended to be uh, used to control soybean looper in Brazil um, with a very similar approach in terms of manufacture, distribution and deployment to what we have for the full army room as well. And again, very similar benefits, focusing on reducing pest populations, protecting existing pest control tools, and improving sustainability uh, by reducing the use of insecticides. And the, the full army room project here um, is something that Oxitec has been working on together with Bayer uh, for almost six years now. And we began a long-term collaboration in 2015 and made that public uh, late last year. And we're very excited about this. This has been an extremely fruitful partnership and we look forward to continue to develop this, this really important tool together with our colleagues at Bayer Crop Sciences. All right, I think that's our last slide. So I will stop there and hand this back to Dave uh, who will moderate our question and answer session. I will, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nathan and Kevin. Very nice, and uh, it was really great to see the the breadth of of uh, the technology that that's being developed there. 
Uh, we do have some questions, but I am going to start out with a question from uh, uh, originating with myself here. And I was very interested in hearing a little bit more about the uh, insecticide susceptibility and the predicted impacts. Uh, it sounds like you expect significant introgression over time. And I just wondering um, uh, if that's what you, if that's in fact what you expect and uh, if that's in fact what, what you might predict. Thanks. Sure. Um, maybe I'll go first, Nathan, and uh, you can follow up. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess one thing to point out, Dave, to everybody is that it really is a combination of suppression and uh, you know integration uh, that can really double up here as well. Um, so our background genes, which are all insecticide susceptible, um, because we use insecticide susceptible background strains to develop these uh, insect lines. Um, once those background genes integrate. You know, as you can imagine, it's a case of, uh, you know, injecting susceptible genes into a population that may be resistant to an insecticide. Um, it may be that resistance is yet to develop and it just prevents resistance from developing because of that susceptibility coming in. So there are various combinations there. Um, but also with the potency of, uh, of the insects as a suppression tool, once you bring that population down, so for example, in the case of Aedes aegypti, where we've got uh, very high levels of control um, and suppression, uh, we really have a very high uh, overpowering or overflooding ratio uh, with lots of our mosquitoes um, introgressing their background genetics. So we get a very strong dilution effect um, and we can get, um, as we've shown empirically, uh, we, we can get very good levels of, of uh, insecticide resistance dilution. Um, and as mentioned, you know, in theory, because they're susceptible genes, uh, they can they, they have the potential to stave off resistance from developing in the first place too. So where uh, an insecticide has become less useful or even not useful, uh, there, there's the potential in both those cases uh, to restore some efficacy and potentially uh, allow the foundations of an integrated approach uh, to really uh, be put in place. Great. If, I, if I can just if I can just follow up there, just to say Please on do. the on the empirical front, we have demonstrated this for the diamondback moth, um, mm -hmm. and we've published that. I think it was in twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen. So you can find a link to that paper on our website, uh -huh. um, and it's also something that we continue to work on with with our other insect strains as well. Good. Well, let's let's go to some questions from uh, from our uh, participants. Uh, here's one from uh, Michael Montague. He says uh, various other methods from insecticides to SIT, when applied in coordinated long-term campaigns, have managed to completely exterminate the target species from whole regions. Uh, would coordinated use of the uh, OX5034 or similar systems in other species be able to achieve such results? Sure, um, I'll go first again. Um, <clears throat> we certainly hope so. Um, that, you know, that's the objective, uh, particularly for things like malaria. Uh, we really would like to, um, if, if we can, you know, provide the opportunity to remove vectors such as Stevenson and Anopheles Stevenson from those areas which it's recently invaded. Uh, where a vector or a, a pest is, is far more widespread and, and been there much longer, you know, it might well be a, case, a more of a case of managing as opposed to uh, local eliminations, uh, but it certainly has the potential to do so. Uh, and the screwworm programs, you know, looking at uh, eradications on a continental level, just demonstrate how effectively these approaches can be used. Um, you know, every pest has its uh, has its differences, if you like, in terms of its its, its ecology and biology, but um, but there's certainly the prospect of uh, you know, very wide area reductions um, are down to very low uh, levels, if not to local eliminations that I mentioned. Uh, maybe I just add, you know, of course, that uh, some places, uh, that, you know, are islands, you know, not necessarily uh, surrounded by sea, but surrounded by, by areas where the pest isn't. And so those areas in particular uh, might be very good candidates uh, for some kind of uh, elimination attempt. Great, thanks. Now, here, here's one: Is your uh, is your community outreach strategy in Florida uh, different than it was in Brazil? In other words, do you modify your communication strategy depending upon your locality? Yeah, we do indeed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, we do. Um, 
everywhere is different, uh, you know, uh, some more so than others. Um, but it's one thing that we've learned is that uh, uh, we need to modify those uh, community engagement strategies. And that's why we use those, the, those local partners, because uh, they know exactly uh, how to do so. Uh, it might be going through community leaders and particular, you know, cultural leaders who are, who are, who are very prominent, um, that may or may not be the same uh, in different locales. Um, and also, you know, people use different vehicles. Um, so in the Florida Keys, for example, radio is a really strong medium uh, for communication. Uh, just one example. And, um, and so radio advertisements, radio promotions, radio uh, shows and, and discussions have, have, have been used a lot. Um, so yes, is the answer, Dave, and, and, and uh, to the person who asked the question, uh, we, we adapt constantly uh, with the local partner uh, and are very mindful of doing so. Thanks. Here's another question from one of our participants. Um, did, did your Brazil field trials result, uh, results indicate that after suppressing Aedes aegypti populations, other mosquito pests attempted to fill its environmental niche? And uh, uh, there was a follow-up comment here, was, was uh, your GM technology is impressive and I wish Ati had continued success. Uh, great question. Uh, Nathan, I'm happy for you to take that one if you like. Just yeah, I'm happy to do that. Over. Well, um, so in Brazil, we have monitored alongside Aedes aegypti, we also monitor the other uh, arbovirus vector, Aedes albopictus, um, which is often present in very similar locations. And throughout that four-year pilot program, which Kevin talked about, where we were targeting a city of 65,000 people, um, and then also in the releases of our second generation technology, OX5034, we monitored Aedes albopictus and didn't see any evidence of niche replacement as a result of the dramatic reductions in Aedes aegypti. So um, that's definitely something which we take into account, which regulators are often interested in as well. Um, but there we have not seen any evidence of other mosquitoes filling that niche. We've also looked at this in Panama. Um, so a study that was done there in 2014 also saw no evidence of Aedes albopictus taking over. So I think um, that's now over multiple field seasons in multiple different locations. Um, I think that's fairly strong evidence that the reduction in, in Egypti specifically is unlikely to lead to albopictus really filling that niche and taking over. It's also important to note that Egypti is the major vector of these viruses. Um, it, it seems to be more efficient in transmitting and, and actually acting as a vector in, in most places where it's been looked at. Yeah, great, thanks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump the queue with a question from myself again, actually, because you, you sparked one in me, and that was, can you say something about any of the, any of the epidemiological data that you've collected uh, in conjunction with your mosquito suppression? Um, Kevin, do you want to take that one, or would you like me to? Um, uh, we can both go, um, but I'll, I'll just start with a little bit on uh, one of the Brazil studies. Um, we, you know, we're a, ve a vector control technology, if you like. So, you know, of course, uh, with the mosquitoes, you know, the goal of the user might well be to uh, reduce disease, of course. Um, but our claims are around vector control uh, and um, the establishment of you know, of large randomized control trials, you know, over multiple years at multi-million uh, dollars um, is not something that we've completed, um, you know, because, you know, it's a, it's a kind of chicken and egg situation in the fact that you can't get to those until you've done small trials. Um, however, um, we have done some pretty big trials, uh, even so, as I mentioned, 65,000 people uh, up to in Brazil at one time. And our collaborators there, uh, vector control municipalities, have collected data, um, uh, so independently collected from ourselves, uh, and uh, and they've shown reductions in disease cases in the areas that we released in compared to areas that we re weren't releasing in within the same year in the same sites, so in the same city. Um, so there is, if you like, um, uh, there is uh, evidence there that reducing the vector in the case of Aedes aegypti does reduce disease, um, uh, but it isn't, um, you know, fully completed randomized control trials um, at that kind of scale uh, to show and exactly quantify uh, that relationship 
between uh, the level of vector and the level of disease. I, I hope that answers uh, your question. Nathan, feel free to add. Yeah, great, thanks. Oh, good. good, here's a question from our one of our participants. Now there's quite a few questions in here and, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna, so it starts out that, thank you for your presentation, uh, really cool work. Uh, and he has a couple, and they have a couple of questions. Uh, First one was, will you continue to do nonprofit work with mosquitoes and others in affected areas? And will the technology be affordable for small non-commercial communities uh, slash farmers? I'm gonna read some of the other questions embedded in here. There's quite a few. Um, is Oxitech working on any third generation technology? Are mosquitoes not important bulk insects as food for others? So I think that's a, an ecological uh, reference. Um, um, and is Akitech aiming for local extinction or only suppression? And I'm going to stop there. Those are quite a few questions in there. There's a few others. If we have time, I'll get back to that particular uh, participant and, 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 and get those. But go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, Dave, could you repeat the very first one? I, I, I yeah, sure. I there were quite a few there. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, the first one had to do with, will you continue to do nonprofit work with mosquitoes oh, yes. Great. Uh, and yeah, others in affected it. areas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, um, uh, super question. And uh, absolutely we will. Um, we are, you know, we're here to make an impact. You know, it's a technology that we know could have a huge, had huge, huge benefits. Um, making an impact is, is critical to us. And so just for example, uh, the Anopheles work that Nathan has talked about is done under a global access agreement with the Gates Foundation. So isn't, uh, uh, you know, in those countries that, that, that really need access and where affordability is a problem, you know, it isn't a commercial venture. It, it, it's a way of uh, contributing to a global challenge. Um, so affordability is something that um, will be, you know, implicit, if you like, in, 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 that in, in, in making impact in, in that sense. Um, but even where we're talking about something like uh, Aedes aegypti, um, where, you know, we, we do expect it to be a commercial product, uh, we know that we can get those costs right down because of this, this uh, very simple release system. Uh, we can remove all those laboratory costs. Uh, we can get this down to the price, you know, to a price that is, you know, very um, palatable, I think, for vector control municipalities, uh, even for homeowners, potentially. Um, and then uh, it can also get into the hands of lots of different people. And by lots of people having access at an affordable price, you know, that's the way that these kind of technologies will make impact. Uh, it's very difficult to do so if, if things are expensive, highly technical, and only available to, 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 to a, a few people within distance of a, of a, of a facility, for example. So um, the answer is yes on that one, uh, most certainly. Uh, for third generation, um, Nathan, um, you can add here, but we, you know, as it stands, um, we have a, a research lines looking at a variety of things. Um, and uh, for most of our insects, um, we are deploying the second generation. Uh, but we do have uh, a third generation where we, uh, where we can get the lethality and essentially uh, right about at the start. So it's um, uh, sperm lethal, if you like. So you don't actually get any progeny at all. Um, a bulk food source uh, was the next question. Is it a bulk, what about it being a bulk food source uh, for other insects? And in the case of Aedes aegypti, I'll, I'll take that one uh, first. Um, in the case of Aedes aegypti, it really isn't a bulk food source for almost anything. Um, in the Florida Keys, for example, there's uh, over 40 uh, different mosquito species uh, there and the bulk food sources for most insects, uh, other insects, or for mammals and other species, uh, tend to be the uh, more proliferous um, nuisance biters, if you like, as opposed to Aedes aegypti, which tends to uh, uh, really um, only compose a, a small percentage of, uh, of, of animals' diet, just a couple of percent maybe. Um, Nathan, I'll, I'll let you fill in any gaps. Yeah, just on the bulk food source question, I mean, Aedes is an invasive species in most of its range. So it originated in, in Central Africa, it's thought, and 
has only been in the Americas probably for the last four or 500 years. Um, and I think that's reflected in terms of its, its niche ecologically. Um, and studies have looked at, at whether mosquitoes in general form any significant part of the diet of, of birds or bats um, or other species. And all of those studies have indicated that they are far more reliant on larger, uh, more calorific insects, things like moths, um, things like beetles. So add that to the fact that Aedes aegypti is such a small proportion of uh, mosquitoes in general, um, it really doesn't form a significant part of the diet of any species. And that's definitely been reflected in the ecological assessments, which were done in the US, for example, by, by EPA. Yeah, great. Okay, we're going to, we have some other questions from other participants. And I'm going to move on to some of those now. If there's a couple more from that one participant who had a, a number of questions. If we have time, we'll get back to some of those. Um, here's one. Is, how, do you address, how do you address a possible lab adaption of your insects? Uh, great question. Uh, Nathan, I'll hand on to you. Sure. So I think what's meant here is, is probably lab adaption in the sense of uh, a mosquito strain that's been colonized in the lab for several years and, and it's maybe not as competitive against wild mosquitoes. Um, so that is not something that we've seen to be a problem. Um, we, as part of our production processes, have regular quality control to make sure that our mosquitoes that are produced continue to be competitive in, in mating with wild mosquitoes um, and continue to be fit in all of the various aspects that that, is, that, that involves. Um, and that's reflected in the field data. So the, the mosquito strains which we've released in various countries are extremely competitive in mating with wild mosquitoes. Um, so yes, it's something which I think could be a concern if you have lab adapted strains for a very long time, um, but that's not something which we've seen to be a concern. Kevin, I don't know if you want to add any to that. Um, you know, um, only that, you know, if we do see, uh, if we did, you know, we monitor, we have obviously a very tight quality control process uh, on our, on our uh, strain production. And if we ever did see any adaptation uh, that was significant, we can always outcross that you know, uh, into a wild background to, to restore any vigor that was lost. So even though we don't see it, uh, if we did see it, it'd be something that we could pick up and we could account for. Yeah, great. Here's another question from one of our participants. Um, can the female specific genes function in arthropods such as ticks? Um, I can take that one. So it will depend on whether you can identify a particular uh, sex specific splicing module that works in a particular arthropod. Um, so what we see is that some of these splicing modules can be transferred between different species, um, but some of them can't. So it'll be a case of identifying whatever it is that that particular arthropod uses to, to carry out its sex determination pathway and maybe engineering something from that. Um, I can't speak specifically to ticks. I don't know enough about their genetics, but um, if you can identify those kind of uh, differentially expressed genes and, and the mechanism to actually achieve that, yeah, I think you could do something. Okay, great. Now, this next question has some overlap with one of the ones we just answered, but I think there's some there's a, there's a nuanced difference here. So the question is, uh, first, a comment. Thank you for your description of the evolution of your first generation to second generation 80s product. Um, the question is, is there a vision for a third generation approach that further sustains suppression, suppression from a release? Um, uh, well, as mentioned, you know, we already have uh, third generation strains for particular, um, for particular products. So for example, um, if um, any larvae uh, in a fruit, uh, for example, uh, was, was a bad thing. So if you had uh, eggs laid and larvae developing and dying at an early stage, but actually burrowing into the fruit was, was an issue because of a particular crop. Uh, we can avoid that with a third generation uh, technology or platform, uh, which, get, uh, which has the lethality right back, um, really at a post-fertilization stage. So, um, so there's a third technology, a third flavor, if you like, uh, um, already in the system. In terms of a technology that is persistent, um, you know, has a longer term persistence, if you like, 
Um, at the moment, that's not on our cards. Uh, persistence is something we want to avoid typically. Um, so our, you know, uh, one of our requirements uh, when we when we're when we're generating these products at the moment is is really to avoid uh, long term persistence. Um, so that's always been one of our objectives. Um, things may change in the future, of, of course, but um, as it stands, uh, a a a a a strain of that ilk, you know, is not on the cards for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I um, see we're doing okay on time, and we have more questions, so I'm, I'm going to keep them coming. Um, so this one is. Uh, why, why did the pink bollworm and diamondback moth research not continue after the first field trials? Uh, Nathan, I'm happy to take it. Yeah, go for it. That's yeah. um, so the, back, back in the early days, the pink bollworm uh, studies were, were just markers. Uh, so they were um, strains that carried one of our markers uh, because uh, the SIT programs there uh, were having difficulty uh, distinguishing um, between wild type uh, and released insects uh, because their markers were, were, were physical markers and they were, they were actually deteriorating over time and it was causing uh, false positives. Uh, so they used an integrated marker. That was our early pink bowl worm work. Um, our more recent work um, uh, in agriculture uh, uh, in the US, uh, particularly uh, diamondback moth studies, um, they were cage studies and then an open release. Um, and those, uh, those studies were, were really um, research driven in nature, uh, uh, you know, in, in, their, in, their, in their goals. Uh, as with a lot of our work, uh, actually, both with mosquitoes as, as well, um, often these projects are done, you know, to find out, uh, to see if something's going to work in a particular area, but also to look at biology or operations or ecology as well. So there's a whole, a lot of reasons why um, projects are finite and uh, they, they don't end up turning into a, a you know, an, an implementation, if you like. Uh, sometimes they're in a particular area um, or just for a particular uh, season or two. Uh, depending upon um, depending upon the collaborators and funding, etc., as well. Okay, uh, great. Here's a. Let's see, where am I here? Uh, okay, yes, here we are. Um, yeah, so the next one on our, our list of questions here is um, uh, the the fall armyworm is highly mobile. Uh, does that constrain the approach? Uh, conversely, perhaps it means a larger area needs to be treated to achieve significant population reduction. Uh, what sort of area needs to be treated? And then sort of re related to this, uh, uh, in small holder cropping systems in Africa, would a inverted comma public health approach, and I, I, I take that to mean perhaps an area wide approach, be needed rather than individual farmers using the method? Nathan, do you want to have a go? Yeah, some, some great questions there. Um, so fall armyworm can definitely, mo can definitely be mobile over long distances, um, but most fall armyworm will only migrate a relatively small distance in their lifetime. So the flight range tends to be in several hundreds of meters. Um, and that's been backed up by a lot of mark release recapture studies done both by others and by ourselves um, as part of the preparation for this project. So in terms of the, the kind of areas which could be treated, um, like to be based around that sort of flight-based mobility rather than insects being carried on the wind, I would think. Um, but the other thing to note about full army worm is that typically, in, certainly in countries like Brazil, there are already tools which are in place and we would see ours as being implemented together with existing tools. So BT crops, um, although, as I said, resistance is becoming a significant problem, there are still traits, the, the VIP-3 trait particularly, which is still effective in controlling that insect. Um, and so we would see ours as helping to protect traits which are already in existence, helping to restore the effectiveness of traits where resistance has started to develop, um, but definitely working together with those tools so that it's not a standalone solution, but we would see ours as working together with others. Um, when it comes to the question about uh, deployment in Africa, for example, 
Um, I think, again, that this is a scenario where it's going to be important to work together with local communities to understand what their needs are. Um, if there's a need for some sort of cooperative approach or some sort of uh, larger scale deployment, that's something which would be driven by particular local communities and, and their expressed needs. Um, so I think that's something definitely which is, is up for discussion and, and something which we're looking at. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, is uh, short and sweet. And how long does the population stay suppressed? Good question. Uh, case by case, uh, I think is the right answer. Um, it really depends upon, uh, we know that our, our insects will disappear in usually three to 10 generations. And so it depends a little bit on the biology of the insects and how long that suppression has been, has been performed over as to how, <clears throat> how low that suppression has got to. And then of course, on how quickly um, that pest can come back through immigration from outside areas. So more isolated means that you're going to get a bit more of a, a longer lasting effect and less isolated areas, you know, um, not may maybe very long at all. What I can say is that we've seen uh, with our Aedes aegypti programs with very small areas, you know, just, uh, just a few hectares within a dense city, um, we've seen uh, the effect, uh, you know, once we've stopped releases, uh, going through, uh, bleeding through into the next season. So lasting out that season and then bleeding through into the next season also, uh, even on a very localized scale. So if we were to uh, do a much larger program, uh, you know, uh, particularly in an isolated area, uh, there could be substantial uh, 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 benefits in terms of uh, that time of suppression post-release. Okay, this, this next question is, uh, is an interesting one. Uh, the, the, it goes, I'm from Pakistan, and here the major agricultural pest is uh, you know, whitefly. Um, he says, tell me about gene drive and whitefly. The major limitation is about sex determination, which is haplodiploid system. Um, uh, and we'd like some ideas about how, to, how we might control whitefly uh, infestations. Um, perhaps this might be sort of just reframed a little bit in terms of thinking about your technology in the whitefly context, as opposed to gene drive technology, which perhaps might be more apropos here for you to think about your own technology in a whitefly context. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll go first, Nathan, you feel free to follow up. Um, so yeah, whitefly are haplodiploidy, uh, they're aerotokus, and, and therefore, um, you know, they present a slightly different challenge. Um, what's probably more important uh, from a whitefly perspective is the fact that they mechanically transmit viruses and the males uh, transmit viruses too. So, um, you know, a, a phloem feeding insect that transmits viruses at all stages. And although direct feeding is, you know, a big problem with them, uh, particularly in, in cotton in Pakistan, for example, it's really more about virus transmission. Uh, and so, when you're going to release millions of males, uh, if they're then going to pick up viruses, particularly mechanically, and transmit those viruses, then it becomes a little bit self-defeating. So I'm not saying that it couldn't work with, you know, with haplodiploid insects. Um, it certainly could in the right circumstances. But those insects that transmit viruses, like white flies, uh, 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 present a different challenge. And as such, I wouldn't be top of the list uh, uh, for, 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 for us branching this technology out into other species. Right, and uh, we hit your sweet spot there with sap feeding insects, didn't we? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is, uh, I'd like to know, I would like to know the main principles of your stakeholder engagement model uh, you used to uh, in your engagement practices. Yeah, um, uh, another good question. Um, uh, the first, the, the first one is really partnering. Um, so you know, the first step is for us to partner. Um, uh, that is uh, key to anything, fundamental, um, uh, and that way we can really design a great design a great program. Um, it's essential for us uh, to know exactly how, um, what the uh, 
what the environment, what the people uh, really, what the stakeholders are really looking for to ensure that we can target it effectively. Um, and then we can get in and we can start to, <clears throat> to plan that. And um, you know, step one, if you like, following partnering uh, is really about um, uh, you know, in, informing and, and educating, if you like, sort of making sure our information goes out there. Um, sometimes we're doing surveys at the start just to try and find out what level of um, uh, information is already present uh, in the population, what people know about the technology, so that we can understand exactly how to fill the gaps, if you like. Um, and then we'll share that information as, as best as we can. Uh, once we've shared the information, we can then do further surveys to understand whether that information has been received loud and clear and understood and whether people are actually um, uh, getting, getting what's required from their perspective. Uh, and then we start to, to, to work out ways in which uh, we can incorporate and integrate uh, the community or, or the stakeholders. Um, so that might well be um, uh, bringing them into the project in terms of housing a trap or housing a, housing a release box, etc. Um, or it might be in other ways of promoting the project or, or being a, a champion for those mosquitoes uh, in the environment. It's quite an unusual thing to be releasing more of a particular pest species to control a pest. And particularly with mosquitoes, um, there's that nuance of, uh, you know, uh, of releasing lots of males into the environment and people understanding that they're, they're actually friendly. And, um, and so getting those messages across so that people, um, people really aren't confused uh, or, or under any illusions about these mosquitoes that they may see flying around their environment um, uh, as our males. Um, it's very important for us to make sure that uh, we go through that complete process of, of of planning, informing, understanding, and, um, and integrating um, before we actually get to the point of release. Great, uh, thanks. We're still okay on time, so we're gonna keep working, you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> Welcome. Well, I think it's a, it's a sign of a, of a nice presentation. You have lots of questions and I, I think uh, you'd agree that that's a good sign. Uh, here's, here's a question that really revisits uh, uh, the topic of insecticide susceptibility, but this is, uh, so the, the uh, question is, well, first of all, thanks for a very nice presentation and update on developments of this very promising set of technologies. Uh, in particular, it's nice to see the development of the delivery technology. Uh, I admit I'm having some trouble wrapping my head around the self-limiting technology being useful for introgressing insecticide susceptibility into a population. Can you walk through how that process occurs? Nathan, your turn. <laughs> okay, this is this is quite hard to do without a, a whiteboard and lots of Mendelian inheritance diagrams, but I'll give it a go. Um, so the males which we are releasing uh, are passing on a copy of the self-limiting gene to their offspring. Um, they're also, so those offspring, the, the females which inherit that gene will die, but the males will survive. They're also at the same time passing on their background genes, which in, in our case will include insecticide susceptibility genes uh, to their offspring. And so their, survi their surviving male offspring, are they able to take those and again, continue to pass on those insecticide susceptibility genes to their offspring and so on. Um, and so we have two effects happening here. One is that we have population suppression happening. So within a few generations, uh, within a few weeks of releases, we start to see the population uh, significantly being suppressed. Uh, as we've seen in Brazil, more than 90% suppression. At the same time, we'll have effectively um, a bottlenecking of that population. And because we've passed on these insecticide susceptibility genes into that population, which is then being bottlenecked, um, we have the, the ability to actually have those insecticide susceptibility genes present in that population after that suppression program finishes. And so, although we would expect after some time that population will rebound, um, we have significantly increased the proportion of insecticide susceptibility genes present in that population as a result of the releases of our mosquitoes and the concomitant suppression of that population. Um, and so this is something which we have demonstrated in the case
case of the diamondback moth. Um, but it's also something where we have published quite a bit of modeling work, basically showing how this actually works over a longer period um, with more extended releases of any hypothetical insect that carries insecticide susceptibility genes. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Um, if you're interested in more, I'd say have a look at our website and, and try and find the, the papers where we've actually published on this. You can look at the models. You can also look at the empirical data there, which supports that. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, um, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, I know it's a, a complex thing, but um, you know, essentially, you know, all of our insects are insecticide susceptible. And although the self and those insects that carry the self-limiting gene don't persist, um, the, the insecticide susceptible genes can segregate from those self-limiting genes over multiple generations, and they can uh, feed into the into the background strain, the target strain, if you like, within the environment. So, so that's how you sort of infuse uh, susceptibility into that wild population, and um, um, and, and end up, you know, with it with a, a pretty strong dilution effect when combined with suppression, as, as Nathan mentioned. Right. I guess this next question sort of is related um, uh, to that in terms of this introgression process. Uh, and the question is this, uh, has there been any further evidence from the Brazil release indicating whether genes from the Oxytech mosquitoes can integrate into the wild population and persist uh, a long time? Um, do you want me to take that one? Uh, go ahead, Nathan. I'm yeah. So with the, the first generation of our mosquito, where we had more than 95% of the offspring dying, both male and female, um, even with that one, we would have expected to see some integration of the background genes into the wild population. And that's actually been studied. Um, and there was a paper published in 2019, which demonstrated that for several months, I think up to about two, two and a half years, there was still some presence of the background genetics in the wild population. Um, but again, with that particular strain that we were releasing, OX513A, it was fully susceptible to insecticides and so on. So there was no adverse effect as a result of that, but there was definitely demonstrated evidence that some of those background genes would persist for some time in the wild population, but also decline over time, uh, likely just due to them uh, being diluted by immigration and so on. Um, so that has been demonstrated. And with our second generation mosquito, because we have all of our males surviving, we would expect that introgression to be stronger and, and potentially to persist for longer. Um, and that's something which we're definitely interested in looking at um, and which we are gathering evidence to be able to determine that more, more specifically. Great. I'm gonna make this the last uh, question since we are running out of time. I'm gonna combine two of them that, that are related here. Um, let me read them both to you. You'll see that they, they are related. Uh, so the first way I think this is stated the most succinctly, then uh, can you comment on how you imagine overcoming loss of function mutations of female of the female lethal construct? So that's one. And then related here is uh, you mentioned the potential of your system to prevent or delay resistance to biotech controls in fall armyworm. Have you considered the potential for resistance to riddle uh, potential mutations in the TTA or more relevant to resistance um, mechanisms that metabolize it? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So, yes, from a theoretical perspective, um, resistance could occur. Um, but that is something which we have never observed in, as I said, more than a billion releases of these mosquitoes uh, worldwide, both the first generation and the second generation of our mosquito. And part of our release program is also continued quality control to make sure that we don't have any evidence of resistance uh, occurring within the mosquitoes which are released. Um, the other thing I would say is that the, the mechanism of resistance to the TTAV protein um, is because the protein is understood to interact quite broadly with the, the general transcriptional machinery in cells and to interfere with that if it's expressed at high levels, um, it's, it's a different scenario to where you have an insecticide which has a particular target and where particular target site mutations can then result in resistance. Um, I'd expect that for resistance to really develop and to be effective against the TTV protein, 
you would require multiple mutations in genes and, and proteins which are fundamental to cellular function. And therefore, although resistance might arise occasionally, it's likely to be quite detrimental to, to cells and to organisms where it would arise and therefore not actually persist long-term. Um, and I think that's an advantage of how this particular protein works and, and its mechanism of action, that resistance to it um, is likely to be quite challenging to actually develop in an organism. Great, thanks. So I'm going to make that our last question. Um, I'm also going to, uh, so first of all, thank you very much, uh, Kevin and, uh, and Nathan for your, uh, uh, for your presentation. It's really, uh, really interesting. And I think uh, the number of questions you got uh, reflects, um, reflects the interest of the, uh, of the audience as well. Um, what I'd like to do now before we leave, uh, Tara, if you're listening, I can't seem to share my screen. I'd like to just share one final. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Um, so before we leave, um, what I'd like to uh, tell everybody in the audience is that this webinar series will continue next week. Um, same time, same place. Uh, our speaker will be Luciano Morero from, uh, from Brazil, uh, and we'll talk about a different genetic biocontrol technology that's being tested in Brazil and uh, a very interesting one using Wolbachia. So again, I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Kevin Gorman, Nathan Rose from Oxitech. Fantastic uh, presentation, very stimulating and informative. Invite everybody back next week. Uh, thank you for attending and we'll see you next week. Thank you.